السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جميعا. It is indeed uh, my great honor to warmly welcome you all to another chapter of the Minasra Cerebral Vascular Ground Round uh, webinar organized by the MENA Stroke Organization. It is endorsed by the World Stroke Organization and the American Stroke Association and supported by Boringer, Engelheim, and Medtronic. MENA Stroke Organization is a region-wide nonprofit organization committed to a vision to reduce the uh, overall stroke burden in the MENA region. Organizing the webinars, MENASO contributors or contributes to the uh, comprehensive education to help the entire stroke community. The cerebrovascular ground round webinar is a unique platform that provides comprehensive education about stroke its latest, latest uh, treatments and management. Today's webinar, a webinar we urge everybody uh, to write down their uh, questions in the chat box. And uh, uh, there will be a dedicated session for question and answers after the two uh, lectures presented by our uh, guest speaker. Today's uh, webinar will be chaired by myself and my colleague, Dr. Hassan uh, Saleh, uh, who's a consultant neurologist as at, at uh, Jacob University in Abu Dhabi. We can now start with our uh, uh, first speaker, Dr. Sayyid Arteza Hussein, who will be talking about the relevance of the cerebral collateral circulation and ischemic stroke. Dr. Sayyid Arteza Hussein is the chair of the Department of Neurology at the, in the Neurological Institute at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Dr. Hussein is a consultant neurologist with uh, 17 years of experience in neurology. After com completing his uh, medical degree from uh, Aga Khan University, he underwent uh, extensive uh, postgraduate training in the United States of America. He's an American board certified in neurology, vascular neurology, neurocritical care and neuroendovascular surgery. So we can start our first webinar with Dr. Saeed Artiza right now. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I'd first of all like to thank uh, the Minaso organization and specifically Dr. Taleb and Dr. Sohail for the kind invitation for me to present today. Uh, again, my name is Saeed Artiza Hussein. I'm a vascular neurologist and a neurointerventionist at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, today I've been asked to speak about the relevance of the cerebral collateral circulation in ischemic stroke. I have no disclosures. So let's define the cerebral collateral circulation. So it's a network of vascular channels that provide alternative routes for blood flow when the primary route fails. These alternative channels can be recruited suddenly in thromboembolic occlusions, most commonly seen by us in large vessel occlusions uh, in cardioembolic stroke. But they can also be recruited slowly when you have hemodynamic compromise over, tem over time from progressive stenosis, as is seen in atherosclerotic disease. And then obviously, as most stroke neurologists know and interventionalists experience, um, these are two entities are on a continuum and there's overlap and both can occur concurrently. The bis biggest example of that is when you have tandem occlusions, extracranial ICA with thromboembolism or intracranial MCA or basal artery occlusions uh, related to ulcerated plaque, severe stenosis, and finally when the plaque uh, ruptures at thrombosis. So we have recruitment of collaterals over time, but then suddenly uh, we need to recruit more because of the acute occlusion. So let's define these intracranial collateral pathways. And I would like to reference uh, Professor Liebskin's landmark uh, paper back in 2003 from the Stroke Journal, where he's done a very good job of, of defining these collaterals. And I highly recommend reading this paper. So we can divide them into the intracranial collaterals and further divide into A and B as depicted here. If you, if you look at these different views, um, this is basically looking at 
the intracranial collaterals between predominantly leptomeningeal pathways um, and connections between the anterior and posterior circulation. You can have connections between um, the ICA and the PCA by the posterior communicating artery. There are MCA, ACA collaterals. There are PCA, MCA collaterals. And uh, we also see PCA, ACA collaterals. Around the tectum, there could be collaterals between the PCA and the superior cerebellar arteries. And um, the collaterals through the cerebellar hemisphere between the different cerebellar arteries can be a robust source of collateral flow when we're dealing with um, basilar artery occlusions. And that's the same view uh, in, in, in a frontal plane. And then outside of the leptomeningeal collaterals, obviously, is the circle of Willis, which, uh, or as we say, arterial circle or the, the circle at the base of the brain, uh, which can help connect anteriorly with posteriorly and between left and right. And obviously, it, the presence can be variable, um, depending on whether or not the connections of the anterior communicating artery or ACA are robust, or if the PCAs are fetal in origin so that the, the P1 segments are small. So these can be variable and can dictate, obviously, um, the outcome in stroke. What I would like to highlight is when you are dealing with ICA terminus occlusions and you have a, a significant uh, clot burden, then we have to recognize that those type of clots may be potentially blocking off two of the main pathways when we look at the circle of Willis. So if we take out the PCOM, and then obviously the A1 segment, um, then there is significant disruption uh, of uh, the collateral pathways. And obviously that's why ICA terminus occlusions have um, a poorer natural course. They are more severe disease. As far as extracranial collateral pathways are concerned, um, these are present and they probably have more of a role when we're dealing with occlusions over time. But nevertheless, they can also have a role in acute occlusions and sometimes are of relevance when uh, vessels are sacrificed uh, surgically or endovascularly. So as far as the extracranial collaterals are concerned, um, we have connections between uh, the maxillary artery, uh, the meningeal artery. There are branches then that uh, are dural based that can connect with the ACA. And then um, uh, from the occipital artery connections to the mastoid and then parietal foramen. And one very important collateral pathway is obviously the ophthalmic and the ophthalmic connections uh, via uh, the meningeal artery uh, and furthermore, um, anastomoses between maxillary, um, sphenopalatine and distal branches. And, retrograde filling of ophthalmics um, can be of importance to the ethmoidals. So within the model of ischemic stroke, it's important to recognize uh, what is the role of collateral flow. And then we come back to um, our, the classic model of where we're looking at an ischemic core, penumbra. And after the penumbra, we have an area of oligemia, and then obviously normal tissue. Classically, we've measured um, the cerebral blood flow in uh, milliliters per 100 grams per minute of brain tissue. So the normal is 50 to 55. Area of oligemia is 25 to 35. Penumbra, 12 to 22. And then in the infarct core, less than 12. Historically, the notion has been as the infarct core is irreversibly damaged. And we are trying to prevent this infarct core from expanding in size uh, by salvaging these areas. And this is the area that is dependent upon collateral flow. So it's important to understand that the presence of collaterals will influence infarct evolution over time. And most of my colleagues who deal with stroke have seen this in clinical practice where you have patients that arrive within an hour or two hours and have extensive ischemic changes throughout the hemisphere. 
So patient A as depicted here, you can see that there's an entire hemispheric wipeout in a patient with poor collaterals. And where you have poor collaterals, you, you've lost over 460 billion neurons per minute just in two hours to wipe this out. But then we have a similar patient with an MCA occlusion who has sequential MRs over time. And you can see that the expansion of the infarction is very, very slow. So obviously this is dependent upon good collaterals and the rate per minute of neuronal loss or infarct growth is much lower when you look at the second patient. And so collaterals do influence how patients present acutely and what their overall outcome is going to be. So how can we image these collaterals? There are many modalities available. Historically, before the modern era of imaging, uh, we used a xenon CT and PET scans and different types of MRI scans, uh, TCD, SPECT, quantitative MRA, uh, time of flight MRA, and CTA. But nowadays within the modern era, we predominantly use these four modalities. As far as non-invasive imaging is concerned, we have CTA, um, looking collaterals on CTA on axial cuts. This can be static versus dynamic. Um, by what, what we mean by that is multi-phase CTA, where we have sequential pictures over time. And the overall um, literature seems to be moving in the direction of using dynamic CTA along with CT perfusion because of the ease of use. MR perfusion is obviously available and is carried out by centers that make most of their decision-making based on MR. Um, and then obviously the gold standard is digital subtraction and geography. So this is an example of multi-phase CTA uh, where um, it's divided into good collaterals, intermediate collaterals and poor collaterals. And over different, sorry, over different uh, times, you can see of the different phases, the extent of the collateral. So we have a left M1 occlusion, and over the three phases, we continue to have filling um, of the left uh, MCA circulation. In the intermediate collateral phase, we can see it's not as robust. And with poor collaterals, we can see that there's very slow delayed filling. Um, and so um, that's how we can distinguish between the three. DSA collaterals is uh, well established and it was a grading scale originally um, approved uh, by the ASITN and that is now used more or less ubiquitously, uh, whereas there's grade zero, um, no collaterals visible to the ischemic site. And this is basically comparing to delayed um, venous phase by the, by the time the venous phase arrives, how many uh, collaterals are filling in a retrograde fashion. Grade one, there's slow collaterals to the periphery of the ischemic site with persistence of the defect. Grade two is rapid collaterals to the periphery of the ischemic site with some persistent ischemic defect. Grade three collaterals with slow but complete angiographic blood flow of the ischemic bed by the late venous phase. And grade four is complete and rapid collateral blood flow to the vascular bed in the entire ischemic territory by retrograde perfusion. And these are visible um, on a digital subtraction angiogram when you carry out catheterizations. So as far as CTA and CTP uh, is concerned, so multi-phase CTA showing um, uh, an occlusion um, and showing collateral flow. And then that in itself is helping us to see uh, on the perfusion map, we can see how that corresponds to um, overall mismatch where our CBF less than 30, um, is showing the ischemic core, but then we're seeing um, a significant area of hypoperfused as the Tmax greater than six seconds with a favorable mismatch volume. Um, and so this is showing us that there's um, collateral flow to this area, good collaterals with significant mismatch, and that this patient would be ideal for re uh, reperfusion therapy. MR perfusion uh, basically can be utilized against multimodal imaging with um, diffusion, uh, 
weighted imaging for an assessment of the core, MRA to understand the occlusion, and then obviously using uh, MR perfusion and Tmax uh, maps. Um, and specifically what has been shown um, to predict um, the status of collaterals uh, in large vessel occlusion is uh, uh, something known as the HIR or the hypoperfusion intensity ratio, where the volume of tissue um, that is critically hypoperfused or ischemic is taken as Tmax greater than 10 seconds. Uh, and you divide that by an oligemic tissue, which Tmax uh, greater than six seconds. And, uh, and so here you can see that the six second map um, and the volume is larger um, the Tmax greater than 10 is smaller. So this would be somebody who is um, um, favorable for mechanical thrombectomy because they have good collaterals. Conversely, on the other side, we can see where there's a larger volume of Tmax um, uh, and a much smaller volume overall of uh, Tmax 6. And so a ratio that is smaller so less than 0 0.4 seconds um, is suggestive of good collateral flow and um, is useful for uh, in selection of patients who would have favorable outcomes with mechanical thrombectomy. So we know how to measure this, but how, how do these collaterals uh, measure up in, as far as the clinical state is concerned? And so we know that there's an influence of the DSA collateral flow on clinical state. So Marx et al. published this paper in which um, when they published collateral score uh, against uh, NIH score, so patients with poorer collaterals have much higher NIH stroke scales. Likewise, um, when we look at the, um, they correlate that with the volume of Tmax greater than six seconds, patients with lower collateral scores have much higher volumes um, in, this, in this state. CTA collateral influence of infarct size and uh, MRS has also been studied extensively. And this is a good paper by Seaman et al. that uh, correlates this. And basically when we look at um, uh, the relation of infarct volumes, um, to collateral grade, as well as clinical outcome, we see that there's a, a strong correlation with um, the collateral grading. So the higher the collateral grade, uh, the smaller the clinical, uh, sorry, the, the final infarct volume. And then the NIH stroke scale. So CTA collateral influence on infarct size um, has been studied uh, as well as the clinical outcome by uh, Seaman et al., and um, which is depicted in these graphs here. And what this basically again shows is that when the collateral grade is um, better uh, in, the, in, this, in these patients, um, overall their clinical outcome is better. And, uh, and this has been uh, well studied and well described. So how about collaterals and reperfusion? The conflicting reports in the literature may be related to the heterogeneous modalities of assessing collateral flow. But furthermore, it's important to recognize that the volume of infarction versus location of infarction influences in functional outcome too. So, and that may have a bearing uh, on how, whether or not uh, many of these studies have shown a good clinical outcome or not. Overall, if you think about it simplistically, you know, we could kind of dichotomize um, the relationship between reperfusion and collaterals. What's intuitive is that if you have good collaterals in a large vessel occlusion and you have successful recanalization, the outcome should be good. Conversely, if you have a patient with poor collaterals and they are not reperfused, we believe that the outcome would be poor. And I think most of the literature does show that. Where there is uh, conflicting data is that we have trials that have suggested uh, registries and trials that have suggested that um, 
collateral status may or may not influence outcomes, whether or not the patient is reperfused or not reperfused successfully. And I think, again, a part of that does uh, matter uh, based on the location of, of where your final infarct volume is. So in this instance, where we had an M1 occlusion and the patient is successfully recanalized and there's significant sparing of the final infarct volume, we do have a uh, significant infarct within the basal nuclei and involving the internal capsule with some mild hemorrhagic conversion. So even though volumetrically, the final infarct volume would be good, potentially uh, the functional outcome um, is influenced by other factors, which is the location of the lesion, and obviously if there's any secondary complications. So collaterals are important, but are not the only determining factor. And a lot of the literature does show that. Bang et al. actually showed this nicely where they um, um, stratified patients based on whether they had poor collaterals on this end of, the, of, the, of this uh, graph versus good collaterals. And in patients where there was poor collaterals, obviously the infarct core is much more larger. Yes, they can have um, some mismatch, but there isn't a whole lot of benign oligemia. Whereas when you look on the other end of the spectrum, overall patients with good collaterals may have much smaller infarct cores, yet um, significant tissue with mismatch and oligemia. So how about collateral flow augmentation? So this is an intense area of research. And yes, in this era of mechanical thrombectomy, uh, obviously thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy when we're dealing with large vessel occlusions, um, it's all about speed. It's all about um, uh, assessing the patient quickly, making a decision, um, administering TPA if and when indicated, and then uh, speeding off to the angiography suite uh, to recanalize the vessel and reperfuse the tissue. But what about endeavors um, outside of thrombectomy or in the time building up to thrombectomy? Are there other endeavors? So this has been uh, a lot of these um, uh, treatments or potential factors that can influence outcome have been studied. Head positioning has been looked at and the head post trial um, failed to show any difference. But when we actually measure blood flow in these patients, uh, yes, keeping the head down does improve blood flow to the ischemic tissue, but we have not been able to show that it influences outcome. Likewise, blood pressure. Um, stroke guidelines currently allow for permissive hypertension up to 220 by 120, um, at least in the American Heart Association stroke guidelines. Um, and additionally, um, the, um, uh, if there is thrombolysis, obviously it's less than uh, 180 by 105. Um, but there's uh, been extensive area of research on whether inducing hypertension or permissive hypertension and acute occlusions uh, can help. Within the era of thrombectomy, uh, there's been extensive research into the influence of general anesthesia. When we uh, induce general anesthesia and its influence on MAP and what it does to cerebral perfusion and what it does to outcomes. And obviously um, this is an area of intense research where uh, we want to optimize collateral flow while we're leading up to mechanical thrombectomy. Volume status of patient, uh, which again, hydration, uh, is key and is important. There's some landmark data from the early days um, um, of stroke where just delivery of a liter of normal saline um, had influence on uh, infarct volume and uh, clinical outcome. Um, recently, there's been study of volume expanders and looking at albumin, which has been a negative trial. Um, but these initiatives have failed to show clinical benefit, but when we uh, look at overall blood flow, uh, we believe that some of these uh, factors may influence. And so, especially as we're uh, getting ready for mechanical thrombectomy, um, uh, focusing on blood pressure, 
for perfusion and hydration status um, and, uh, is important, but perhaps there's going to be more important role um, during and after the procedure. Finally, as far as medications are concerned, there's a lot of data about the role of statins and their influence on collaterals, which is obviously more uh, relevant in patients who are previously on statins, who have underlying atherosclerosis. And there's some basic science uh, research and, uh, and clinical interest in the use of nitric oxide as uh, something that can uh, help improve collateral flow. But it's important to understand that when we are assessing collaterals, we have to look at collaterals over time. So if a patient presents to you right now with a large vessel occlusion um, with significant clinical imaging mismatch or perfusion-based mismatch, that tells you that, okay, this patient is okay right now. The collaterals seem to be working right now, but there is risk that these will deteriorate over time. And we know from the natural course and the natural uh, history of large vessel occlusions that patients with large vessel occlusions will deteriorate over time. So it's important to understand that collateral flow in acute large vessel occlusions is dynamic. It's influenced by other factors. And what is good now may not be good later. And this is our relevance in clinical practice when we look at about patients with LVO who have a low NIH stroke scale. So historically, when we look at uh, the pivotal trials for mechanical thrombectomy, um, some of the trials, especially Mr. Clean, MR Clean, um, included patients with very low NIH stroke scales. And it has been well documented that mechanical thrombectomy makes a difference across the whole spectrum of NIH. But some trials did exclude patients with low NIH stroke scales. And that's been an intense area of debate and research. What do you do with somebody who has a proximal MCA occlusion and um, a low NIH stroke scale? Whether or not they get TPA, if they're within the window, they'll be thrombolized. If they're not within the window, um, what do you do in that scenario? Do you treat the occlusion? Do you take them now? Uh, do you wait till they deteriorate? And that's a, an intense area of research. And a lot of the natural course of the disease that's been published by many colleagues is that a lot of patients with large vessel occlusions may deteriorate later and that there's a window of opportunity to act now. So it's important to recognize the concept that yes, you have collaterals that are good right now at this moment in time and that your infarct is small, but overall there is risk that this will change over time. And most recently, there's been a very nice paper on JAMA Neurology looking at this, and um, where in patients intended uh, to be uh, treated with IV TPA with large vessel occlusions and low NIH stroke scales, uh, when they looked at uh, what predicted uh, early neurological deterioration secondary to ischemia, they only found two relationships. One was the site of occlusion, and the second was the thrombus length. And actually, collateral flow or collateral status did not have any influence. It was not able to predict who was going to deteriorate or wasn't going to deteriorate. And so that's where, yes, collaterals are important, but not the only determining factor. And as we know, the patients with proximal large occlusions or tandem occlusions or basilar occlusions, these are the patients that will deteriorate. And as it has been shown previously, that the longer the thrombus length, the probability of deterioration is higher. And this highlights the importance of recanalization and reperfusion of the ischemic tissue. So yes, the collateral status in the acute large vessel occlusion scenario is important, but is not the only predicting factor. Um, and we have to really think about recanalization and reperfusion. Um, so what is the final message? Collaterals preserve tissue in the acute ischemic model. We know that. Collaterals influence infarct growth and final infarct volume. 
However, it's successful reperfusion strategies that determine the final outcome. Finally, additional research is ongoing and augmentation of collaterals to improve outcome is uh, where a lot of the research is going to be done. As you all know, mechanical thrombectomy has been established as a treatment. We can open vessels and we can open them fast. The next frontier is what can we do to preserve tissue while between the decision making and the treatment and how can we continue to promote flow and prevent secondary uh, neuronal injury um, uh, after reperfusion. And I think collateral flow and obviously a lot of basic science research that is being done is going to help assist us with um, looking at the influence of collaterals and neuroprotectants in these patients. So that concludes my uh, talk here today. And uh, once again, I thank you all for listening and I thank Minaso for the opportunity. And um, I'm happy to take any questions when we're in the question and answer section. Thank you. I'm to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammed Al-Kuwaiti. Dr. Al-Kuwaiti is a consultant neurologist in Tawam Hospital. He has more than 13 years experience in the field of neurology and vascular neurology. He's completed his residency program from McGill University in Montreal and followed by vascular neurology fellowship from the famous University of Minnesota. Uh, it is a honor and pleasure to introduce Mohamed al Kuwaiti, who will talk us uh, in secondary prevention in stroke. Thank you, Dr. Kuwaiti. Okay, uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Mohamed al Kuwaiti. I'm a neurologist at Tawam Hospital. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, for this session. I'll be presenting on cryptogenic stroke, uh, the term ESIS and, and secondary stroke prevention. Okay, I have no disclosures for, the, for this session. Uh, my objective is I'll be defining cryptogenic stroke and the term ESIS, approach to the diagnosis and the underlying cause of cryptogenic stroke and the potential role of atrial fibrillation, atrial cardiopathy and PFO. And finally, I'll speak about PFO closure and new guideline um, regarding this. So um, the definition, so cryptogenic stroke is an umbrella term. It's a stroke of unknown cause. However, it takes uh, uh, much more, uh, it takes lacunar stroke and non-lacunar stroke uh, and cases who are not completely uh, worked up. So the term ESIS uh, was, was coined uh, around six years ago to specifically define uh, embolic stroke uh, of undetermined source a clot that traveled and patient had a comprehensive workup. This term was coined by uh, Dr. Uh, Hart uh, around seven years ago. And um, it includes 20, around 25% of stroke cases are actually cryptogenic and around half of these are ESIS. If you look at the burden and features of uh, ESIS patients, this is a pooled analysis of uh, uh, of uh, uh, cryptogenic stroke cases or ACES patients. And uh, uh, actually these patients have a, usually have a smaller stroke, an age of five, a median an age of five. Uh, their age is around 65. Uh, this study says 65 is actually a younger age. However, this is a Western study. So you have to take this age uh, carefully. And uh, usually these cases have less uh, risk factors and the stroke uh, annualized stroke risk in these cases around 4.5%, which is not that high. And uh, looking at the, the workup that we do for uh, uh, stroke patients, I found this uh, great uh, uh, article at the New England Journal of Medicine by Professor Saver, uh, where he uh, uh, defines the standard evalu evaluation of stroke patients. So. As you all know, the standard evaluation is, uh, so after history and physical, we do the regular blood workup, cardiac ECG, 24 hour uh, halter monitor, cardiac imaging, looking at vessels in the, in the head and the neck. Um, these are the basic things that we do. However, if these work, if this workup is actually negative and it kind of explain the etiology of the stroke, you can, you can move up for the, further to an advanced evaluation or you can, you can uh, ask for a hypercoagulable workup 
you can ask for a prolonged cardiac monitor for up to a month uh, as a non-invasive uh, uh, recorder. And also you can uh, try looking for signs or uh, of, of uh, vasculitis or um, uh, looking for, uh, trying to do a transcranial double to see if there's any uh, monitoring of, you can do monitoring of emboli or emboli detection. However, if still you couldn't find the cause of the stroke, there's other things you can do. Uh, for example, you can look for uh, occult cancer. You can further look into a prolonged cardiac monitor with a loop recorder that goes up for three years. And uh, uh, you can look at the structure of the heart by doing an MRI or a CT and uh, uh, trying to get probably, uh, some patients will require CSF analysis Probably a, a, some patient will require brain biopsy, vasculitis, for example, is, is, a, is a, uh, there's a suspicion of, of vasculitis. And then there's genetic testing. Uh, and some PFO cases you can also do uh, Dopplers of the lower limbs and upper limbs. And uh, you can also look at, can do MR venous of the pelvis. So in terms of uh, ESIS cases, uh, the management recommendation right now is usually aggressive medical therapy and antiplatelet. There's no enough evidence that anticoagulation uh, is beneficial. Uh, there was a recent uh, randomized controlled trials uh, done uh, uh, navigate ESIS and uh, respect ESIS. So navigate looked into a reverxidion and um, comparing it to aspirin in uh, patients who have ESIS. And this study was stopped early on because of no benefit and there's a higher chance of bleeding in patients on, on the Rivaroxaban. And Debigatran also did not show uh, a benefit over the aspirin on the, in the RESPECT ESIS trial. Uh, however, looking at the sub-analysis of uh, these trials, you'll see that uh, they, uh, the etiologies, they included patients with ESIS, however, uh, uh, the patients were looking at sub uh, analysis of different etiologies in these cases. Uh, so there were some etiologies that favored anticoagulation, for example, uh, left atrial enlargement, for example, or left ventricular disease. And uh, usually patients who have atherosclerosis uh, favors more aspirin. Uh, I include this diagram because ESIS uh, is, is again another umbrella term. There's a lot of uh, different etiologies that can lead to ESIS. However, we have to def try to define the etiology to be able to uh, coin the best therapy. So uh, as, as you can see here, there's uh, examples are like atrial cardiopathy, which is, which is a new risk factor, which is a risk factor people are looking into, looking into and uh, uh, prolonged cardiac monitor to look for a further uh, like a risk of AFib, or looking at the uh, PFO status, uh, looking at the, uh, the, uh, the aortic arch uh, or cancer. So in this slide, I have uh, different types of cardiac monitoring to detect AFib. And if you see, it starts with the simplest one, which is the ECG. And you see the percentage of detecting AFib with a simple ECG is up, up to 2.7%. However, in a, in a stroke unit where you can do a telemetry, the risk, the, the percentage of detecting AFib goes up higher to up to uh, around threefold to up to 7.6%. There was a study, uh, Embrace study, a Canadian study, uh, 16 centers where they compared Holter monitor for 24 hours and um, a mobile um, cardiac monitor, uh, like a patch, a uh, non-invasive one for 30 days. And uh, there was significant difference in, in detection of AFib. Uh, so it was about up to 16% if you monitor for 30 days compared to around uh, less than 5% if you monitor for 24 hours. So it's, a, it's a significant difference. And there was a crystal AF trial looking at uh, cardiac loop recorders uh, where they, uh, AFib detection was up to 30% if you monitor for uh, up to uh, uh, three years. These are diagrams, these are pictures of uh, these recorders. So this is a, the regular halter monitor. Uh, this is the non-invasive patch that can go up for, for a, a month. And this is the loop recorder that goes subcutaneously. And uh, I'm just trying to show here that uh, 
patients who have a, a, a higher CHAD score and patients who are older than 70, their school detecting if uh, AFib is uh, much higher, the more you monitor these cases. Uh, coming to atrial uh, cardiopathy, so uh, the size of the uh, the size of the left atrium matters. So uh, in this uh, this graph, it shows here patients who have moderate to severe left atrial enlargement. They are have a higher chance of developing uh, cryptogenic stroke, cardioembolic stroke. And uh, there was there's a recent uh, study that is still ongoing called Arcadia. And it's comparing apixaban versus aspirin uh, in patients who have uh, atrial cardiopathy, and is defined in the study by doing three different uh, uh, three different tests uh, by doing an, by using an echo, using the serum NT Pro BMP, and looking at the ECG, trying to to measure the PTFV1. Hopefully, in a few years, we'll have more answers. And. Uh, uh, PL4 is a, is a common uh, risk factor. It's actually a common uh, uh, finding in, in the community. So up to 25% of the community will have a PL4. However, uh, PL4 prevalence in patients who have uh, 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 ESIS is much higher. It's going to go up to 45 or even 50% in some cases. And it's always it's actually a tug of war between car interventional cardiologists and stroke neurologists in the past. What should we do with a PL4? So, um, I hope this time we have better, we have more answers now. So uh, this is a, an, a transogial echo with and without Velselva showing the uh, micro, the, ambul, the bubbles crossing into the other side from the right to left. So a PFO closure is uh, done uh, through a, a catheter uh, and it goes all the way up to the left atrium and uh, they, De deploy the, an umbrella-like structure that comes back and then sandwiches the the left uh, the septum, the PFO. Looks like a simple procedure. Uh, there was three major trials in 2012 and 13 that were actually negative. They didn't show any benefit uh, in um, PFO closure versus uh, medical therapy, and. Uh, American Stroke Guideline actually in that 2014, a year later, uh, uh, came up saying that patients with cryptogenic stroke or TIA and PFO without evidence of DVT, the available data do not support a benefit for PFO closure. However, if, if you they only support PFO closure in patients who have risks of recurrent DVT or patients who have DVT uh, and, and, and increased risk of another one. Uh, later, uh, in 2017, there were three randomized controlled trials that were published. They were actually positive trials uh, in PFO closure. And um, I won't go into detail, but these are the, the names of the trials and the patient uh, uh, number. And these are randomized prospective uh, control trials, but they were open label. And uh, looking at the data of these trials, uh, so if you look at uh, the trials here are on the left side, and uh, looking at the device closure versus the medical therapy, uh, there was much less stroke in patients um, on, on the blood closure of the PFO compared to medical therapy. The absolute risk uh, for recurrent stroke re reduction for recurrent stroke was up was 3.3%. And this is a, a table where actually I, I borrowed from a, my colleague uh, it's an interesting table. You see up the first three rows are the negative trials um, and the sec second three rows are the positive trials. I'm trying to feel, see the difference in these trials in, the, in, in patient enrollment. You'll see patients, uh, you'll see that positive trials, they included patients who had ESIS, uh, the ESIS embolic stroke on the source and had a complete workup. And they also looked at the same time, they looked at the anatomical variant of the PFO, uh, looking at the, the shunt and looking at the atrial septal aneurysm. So uh, as you know, there's always complications with procedures. So uh, in this procedure specifically, their complications are AFib uh, and it's, it's up to 4.6% uh, risk of AFib uh, 
and in many of these cases, AFib was actually a transient uh, phenomena. Uh, there is, and this, the, the CLOSE trial published this and they had only one case of uh, uh, atrial flutter and uh, two of ventricular tachycardia, air embolism. And uh, this is a stroke, uh, 2021 stroke guideline. Um, so for ESIS, they include this table here uh, saying uh, there's no benefit for to anticoagulate uh, ESIS patients. It's not recommended to anticoagulate, to, to anticoagulate patients who have ESIS. Um, and there's no benefit uh, on using ticagrelor. This is specifically defined in the, in the new guideline. And looking at the stroke prevention recommendations in terms of PFO, there are um, a new recommendations uh, a few months, few weeks ago. And the first recommendation here is saying that um, it's uh, the PFO closure uh, have to be done in a jointly fashion with cardiology and trying to take into account the pro probability of a causal role for PFO. And, uh, uh, the, and they define patients should be between 18 to 60 years of age with non-lacunar ischemic stroke of undetermined cause despite thorough evaluation and a, and a PFO with a high risk and atypical features. Um, and it's reasonable, so it's reasonable to close uh, this PFO with a trans catheter device. Um, and uh, they actually include this flow chart in the guideline, which I find uh, interesting and useful. So uh, a young patient between 18 and 60 years of age presenting with a, uh, an embolic stroke and PFO. So the first thing you need to do is you have to do a complete evaluation. So the evaluation is suggested here, including uh, Dopplers of the upper and lower limbs and, and uh, pelvic MRVs, and um, there's many, and we already discussed this early on, earlier on, and um, and if if there was no etiology defined, then you move on forward to a potential paradoxical embolism. So uh, then you have to evaluate that the patient have an atrial septal aneurysm or large right to left shunt. So this is the anatomical uh, high risk uh, feature that they that patients have to have. Uh, to be able to say that he has a high-risk PFO. And th in such case, high-risk PFO, PFO closure is reasonable. However, there is still factors uh, uh, that you might want to take into consideration, like looking at the ROPE score uh, or uh, looking at the patient requires anticoagulation. Um, and even the patient, if the patient have a PFO but doesn't have the high-risk features, um, uh, you cannot still try to, uh, PFO closure is not well established. The benefit of it is not well established. However, you can always look at the risk by looking at the ROPE score, um, history of DVT, recurrent stroke. Um. So in conclusion, I'd like to say cryptogenic stroke is a very common diagnosis after a stroke. Complete workup is necessary. And therapy is currently with antiplatelet unless specific etiology was identified. Prolonged cardiac monitoring, monitoring increased rates of detecting atrial fibrillation and atrial cardiopathy as a potential risk uh, factor for ESIS. Um, and PFO closure is reasonable in the age of between 18 to 60 years old with patients who have ESIS, PFO with a high risk anatomical features and, and trying to develop a, 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 like a causal association and join, jointly with cardiology. Um, uh, thank you, and at the end, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to, to invite everybody to Abu Dhabi Brain Conference, which will take place in, uh, online uh, from the 2nd to the 4th of September of this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for this uh, uh, great presentation. Now we would like to start our question and answer session. Okay, we received uh, lots of questions, by the way, but because of the limited time we have, I don't think we'll be able to answer all questions. We'll start with the first question to Dr. Sayyid Artuz.
Sure. Would you proceed with thrombectomy in an M2 occlusion with good collaterals and an NIH score of five, which is less than one, one point for all uh, clinical trials? Because their uh, uh, kickoff uh, NIH was six. Of course, of course. Yeah. So it depends, on, obviously, if it's disabling symptoms or not, um, status of TPA, if thrombolysis is on board. Uh, as of right now, the uh, evidence is mainly for large vessel occlusions. Once we get into M2s, the proximal M2 is still considered by most interventionalists an extension of large vessel. Um, and these patients can deteriorate, and sometimes they have significantly disabling symptoms. So if they're an NIH of five, but they're aphasic and have motor weakness, um, I, I would entertain that and I, I would take them for thrombectomy. Um, but um, that's, uh, there are a lot of case series and registries. I think uh, Dr. Raul Nogueira's group, Diego Hausen's group uh, from Emory University um, have uh, published a, a good registry on, on medium vessel occlusions. And um, I think it has to be considered on a case by case basis, but by nature, if, if it's a disabling stroke, um, I, I end up taking these patients. I think I tend to agree with you, depending on the, uh, uh, you know, how devastating the symptoms a patient is presenting with, regardless of their NIH score and how distal the uh, uh, thrombus is. As you mentioned, if a patient is presenting with only aphasia, aphasia may will come with uh, low NIH score, but uh, I think it's a very important uh, thing to preserve in a patient who's presenting uh, with such a problem and you are able to you know, uh, uh, help him or save, save this uh, you know, uh, issue. Yeah, I think uh, we're looking for direction. Um, hopefully we'll have more direction in the years to come as we get more data on it. Uh, and hopefully the guidelines will reflect that. But uh, the thrombectomy procedure has uh, the newer devices um, uh, are becoming safer. And we've developed a lot more experience with the devices that we can be more careful in the, in the smaller uh, branches now. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I, I get the second question to Dr. Mohammed Kuwaiti. Um, I don't know if you could help with this question, Mohammed, is um, in the borderline in terms of age group. Um, and the question is, do you have experience uh, on BFO closure in younger slash pediatric patient uh, caused, and, caused by non-lacunar stroke? And by young, I mean as young as 9, 10, or 23. Okay. So uh, uh, in the trials that were published, uh, the positive trials, they had cases between the age of 18 and 20. Um, and um, uh, me personally, I, I don't have, uh, I have my, my cases that PFO closure, I had few actually, but they were in their uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, and uh, trying to have a complete workup uh, for these cases, it's not only the PFO, it's not only the embolic stroke, but you have to do a comprehensive workup looking at different aspects, trying to define why the patient had this uh, stroke, uh, including uh, prolonged cardiac monitor, including doing uh, imaging of the, uh, of the lower limb and the upper limb uh, venous system, looking for DVT, and uh, looking, uh, looking also at the structure of the heart by doing an MRI, um, and even evaluating this PF4 in a, in a the using TCD or transcranial Doppler, uh, where you can define uh, the, the severity of the shunt much better than a trans esophageal uh, echo. I think putting things, everything together um, and uh, defining ESIS first um, before, before proceeding for a PFO closure. Thank you. I, I, I guess some of the patient in, um, in both prospect um, study uh, on closure are even younger groups, some of them about 19 and 18. So some of the data may support um, approaching even younger group if the workup is done properly, obviously. Always a difficult question is related to the causation to the actual BFO itself. That often is a very difficult um, question. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, Talib, you can take the second question. Okay. So it's gonna be for Dr. Sayed again. Uh, do you think that uh, 
the treatment window can be further extended in the future based on collateral score. Because you know most of the automated uh, algorithms we have now will, will uh, detect the core of the infarct and the penumbra. But I don't, I'm not aware about any algorithms or AI uh, programs uh, looking at the collateral score. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at this point in time, we have indirect markers of collateral scores. So uh, like I presented the hypo perfusion intensity ratio um, on MR perfusion, and then obviously um, extrapolating CT perfusion. So um, in a way, I mean, you're using that as a, as a, uh, a marker, um, in some cases direct, in other cases indirect. But uh, um, at this point in time, no, I'm not aware uh, specifically of using AI uh, for that in that partic particular scenario. But yes, we're already expanding the window. I mean, the window is up to 24 hours. Um, and who's to say that window, uh, the window should be only at 24 hours? I think one of my cases which showed natural evolution of a stroke on MR over seven days with a very, very small diffusion core. Um, I, I showed a slide of that over seven days, it was significantly small. So every patient has different uh, collateral flow and different perfusion parameters. Um, and so I think, yes, the window will expand. We're gonna move away from a time-based paradigm to a tissue-based paradigm. Um, and, uh, and I think we're already well uh, along the way. So yes, I think that's that's the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question to Mohammed. Um, there's a lot part of the world which is still having developed um, thrombotomy or even thrombolysis surfaces. And I have a question from a few of the audience. What would be the best approach in terms of therapy when you don't have any access to intervention? Uh, that's a question to me. Uh, yes. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, trying to get, uh, having a, uh, trying to, to, to be part of a network where you can send your patients for intervention um, is, a good, is always a good idea, uh, connecting yourself to a comprehensive stroke center or a primary stroke center where they can do all these procedures, uh, including a PFO closure or thrombectomy, I mean, or TPA. Um, and um, uh, either connecting by, with them either by telephone or by, tele, by uh, telemedicine, uh, by seeing the patient and treating the case through a, 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 through a camera. Uh, I, I think this is doable, and especially in the low resource uh, communities and uh, patients who don't have, uh, even thrombectomy, for example, can be done in the low resource communities by uh, non uh, neuro interventionalists like it can, can be done by cardiology in some in some co counties for example there's also uh, neuro interventional uh, the, the body neuro interve interventionalists sometimes they do these procedures if you go, if there's uh, in uh, if it's, if uh, uh, cardiology if the neuro intervention is not available and and i think the question was very broad was from bactemy was tpa was not I think the question um, muhammad uh, along the line what will be the best option available if you are told you have no option of thrombotomy or thrombolysis in somebody brain with acute stroke due to large arterial occlusion and you have no access at all? You just have medical therapy. What will be the best medical therapy? And I think he put the question about dual antiplatelets and whether there's a possible role for anticoagulation. And I no, think he put, uh, he put an, an IH of, um, of five and a large arterial occlusion. So uh, usually in a patient's in an acute stroke, there's no role for anticoagulation. Uh, it's a very high risk of bleeding. And uh, dual antiplatelets is usually recommended for specific cases. Uh, it has to be a, a TIA or a small stroke or patient with intracranial stenosis. Patient who have large stroke or LV, usually patient who have LVO have large infarcts. And in these cases, uh, like uh, giving, uh, using uh, dual antiplatelets or anticoagulation might put the patient at risk of having uh, uh, hemorrhage. And if you add Plavix to these cases, in many of these cases, they might need a PEG. And putting Plavix, Plavix on board will delay their, 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 the length of stay will increase. 
and will delay the procedure in some cases. Some cases, but I would recommend connecting, trying to connect to a to a network where you can patient can be transferred for acute therapy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Talib. Talib, you're mute. So, Dr. Zayed, I think we have a question regarding uh, mechanical thrombectomy and collateral circulation. So, yes. uh, how can we predict the likelihood of reperfusion injury in patients undergoing into, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, or even uh, even with uh, you know thrombolysis? Any relation so, to collateral circulation? Yes. So, I mean that basically. Um, it pertains to the size of the core. So in, within the set, setting of acute occlusions, large vessel or small vessel, um, obviously the timing. Um, so if we look at thrombolysis data and thrombolysis trials, it's based on age, um, size of the infarct, uh, blood pressure control, underlying coagulopathy, hyperglycemia. So there are medical factors that definitely play a role. Uh, and, but volumetrically, the larger the size of the tissue. Within the era of mechanical thrombectomy, when we're doing perfusion imaging and we're looking at the size of the core, um, there's an estimate of that. Um, uh, secondly, uh, on angiography. So when we see that there are poor collaterals and the core is large, then the risk of reperfusion, uh, hemorrhage or injury does go up. And finally, there's some telltale signs after thrombectomy. So if we see early venous filling or deluxe hyperperfusion, every time I see that, uh, I'm quite aggressive with lowering blood pressure. This is an area of research. There are ongoing trials. We're looking at this where in patients with extreme strokes, large cores that have been excluded from prior trials, if they undergo thrombectomy, what is the risk of reperfusion? Also, what's the best blood pressure lowering strategy? So um, a lot of us intuitively will lower the blood pressure as soon as we um, re-canalize and reperfuse the brain. We drop it less than 140 by 90. Uh, some people are more aggressive, less than 130 by 80. Um, what's the data on that? So we don't have level one evidence on that. A lot of it is extrapolated from registries and trials, um, but there are trials underway both on blood pressure and looking at large ischemic cores. So in a nutshell, yes, there are patient factors. There are you know, blood pressure, coagulopathy, sugar, and there are angiographic factors and imaging factors um, that, that uh, dictate this. Thank you. Um, I have a um, final question to Dr. Mohammed. Um, how long would you continue dual antiplatelets, the, the aspirin and colobidigrel, as in the Express trial? Is that for three months, for a year, or lifelong? So it depends on the pathology, what we're treating. Um, dual antiplatelets, like, uh, usually uh, I, I prescribe it for uh, TIA and small strokes following the, uh, the CHANCE trial up to three weeks. Uh, and you can go up to, a, up to one month. The POINT trial uh, have shown that there, you can go up to three months. However, there's a slightly increased risk of bleeding. Uh, so I, I would say one month. Uh, three weeks to one month for patients who have uh, so TIA or small stroke. However, if the patient has history of uh, intracranial stenosis, uh, there's many trials like the Sampras trial and the VSET where they looked at, they compared uh, putting a stent versus dual antiplatelets and aggressive medical therapy. Uh, the medical therapy with dual antiplatelets for three months uh, was better. Um, so I would... Uh, for these cases, I will extend it for, for three months. Uh, usually after three months, we don't have enough evidence to say you can continue further to a year or six months. So up to three months is uh, where is the, the evidence stops there, to my knowledge. And Mohammed, for, for this question, as a personal extension to the question, uh, in people with microbleeds on MRI scans, would you still go ahead and give dual antiplatelets, or will you be a little bit worried about the risk of um, of secondary hemorrhage, even if they got um, extracranial um, atherosclerotic disease, and they present with a TIA? You know, usually uh, stroke risk is up front. It's in the first few weeks, so 
if I can get away with a few weeks of, of dual antiplatelets, uh, I think the patient will benefit. So uh, uh, I might suggest it for, for maybe instead of doing a month, I can, there's a, I can do it for a less period of time, uh, let's say for 10 days or two weeks uh, or even a week uh, overlap. Because the stroke burden is usually at the beginning. Uh, stroke risk, I mean, the highest stroke risk. And um, I, I tend to keep the patient at least on a single antiplatelet. It depends on how bad is the microbleeds. If there's any signs of amyloid angiopathy, that's another another thing. And, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I try to give the patient the best uh, possible uh, 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 prevention plan. Um, if it's amyloid angiopathy, I try to stick to only a single agent. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes we, I try to avoid the antiplatelets and in some cases. Um, blood pressure for amyloid and severe amyloid angiopathy, blood pressure control is uh, the way to go, I see. And uh, however, there's some article where they recommend, uh, they still recommend using antiplatelets. And in some cases, if there's AFib, I've seen uh, patients who have history of, let's say, lobar hemorrhage, they still mm -hmm. recommend you can uh, still anticoagulate these cases if they have AFib but a history uh, and, and stroke and but had a history of lower hemorrhage in the past. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Ali? Okay. I think I have a more generic uh, question for Dr. Sayed. It's about uh, uh, blood pressure management for those patients coming with high blood pressure uh, with the either ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic uh, stroke. Uh, what will be your target? And how aggressive you will go down. Okay, so, so I think uh, for ischemic stroke, it's very clear. I mean, the stroke guidelines uh, state that quite clearly. If there's thrombolysis, if TPA is on board, then we less than one, uh, 185 by 105 is our threshold. Um, otherwise, permissive hypertension within the first 24 hours, uh, up to 220 systolic. Um, for intracerebral hemorrhage, um, right now in our practice, uh, and again, guideline based, less than 160 by 90, uh, aggressive lowering of blood pressure more than that has not really been shown to improve outcomes um, within the first 24 hours. Uh, Recanalization, reperfusion, which is outside of a guideline, uh, we currently do less than 140 by 90. Um, uh, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, but I would refer the uh, uh, person who's asking a question to the guidelines. It's very clear um, about what we should do for blood pressure. Uh, Dr. Assam, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, Dr. Said, um, what is your experience in the challenges facing us with basal artery and posterior circulation strokes in terms of using the CT perfusion and using various technologies in selecting this patient who will come delayed? Do you go for MR or do you still continue using your, um, your CT perfusion with, with the limitations? Yeah, so we typically, we've moved towards MRI. So in the posterior fossa, as Dr. Issam is alluding to, um, we have very good CT angiography and collaterals, but it's such a small area that to generate perfusion maps is hard. You can get some perfusion maps of, of the cerebellum, the cerebellar hemispheres, but uh, within the brainstem, it gets a little challenging. But uh, we for, for basilar artery circulation, if it's hyperacute within six hours, um, most of my colleagues and I will just take the patient. If it's uh, longer than that, within 24 hours, we'll still take them, but we'd like to get a hyperacute MRI prior um, because uh, we just actually had one patient last week uh, within six hours presented to us, but the pons was wiped out, completely wiped out. And then, you know, those are patients that we could actually make worse with reperfusion hemorrhage. So um, I think MR uh, is more reliable. And that too is to get an assessment of the extent of ischemia uh, within the brainstem uh, to get an extent of the core. Um, I, we don't really look towards perfusion in the posterior fossa as much. Thank you very much. I think uh, we reached the uh, end of our uh, uh, webinar for today. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sayed Abdullah Hussain, Dr. Mohammed Al Kuwaiti for their uh, participation and enriching uh, our webinar series.
Also, I would like to thank my fellow colleague, Dr. Issam uh, uh, Saleh. Thank you very much. And uh, to all attendees, I would like to thank you for attending this uh, webinar. I mean, without you, this webinar series wouldn't be successful. And uh, you, you, uh, all of you, uh, there was a question about the certificates. You will get your certificate by uh, email, I believe. I think uh, this, uh, I think with, the, with your registration, you, you submitted your uh, emails and you will get it by email, inshallah. Thank you very much, all, and uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.